Okay, good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here today. We are so excited. And uh, so we do have our presentation for today on equitable gifted identification practices using the Negliary General Ability Test. And we have very special uh, speakers with us today. We have Dr. Jack Negliary, Dr. Kim Lansdowne, and Dr. Dina Bruyez with us. Hi, everybody. And uh, I just want to say thanks for giving us the opportunity to talk about these new instruments that we have created and will be um, published in, in a couple of months. Uh, and the session today is to give everybody a good idea about what these instruments are about and how they came about and what they do and how they can help us with equitable assessment. Um, just note that on the first slide, you have our emails. Um, so I encourage you, if you are, ever want to be in touch with us directly, it's pretty easy to do. Um, we also have a website. Actually, the website just went live a few days ago, um, explicitly on the, these instruments that we've developed. And um, this website will be being built out. You can certainly also go to my website, but go here first. This, this will be the most information, I believe. Um, a couple of things. What I'd like to do is um, start off by helping you understand some of our background and why, how we came about doing what we've done here. I actually started working as a school psychologist in 1975. And when I was administering and doing the kind of testing that I was taught to use, I noticed that lots of times the intelligence test questions looked a lot like the achievement test questions. And it didn't make sense to me. Um, it bothered me. But I just did you know, what I was taught for several years. When I went back to school at my PhD, I started rethinking the whole notion of how ability should be measured when I was in, in my first teaching job at Northern Arizona University, especially when I was working with assessment of native students there, it became painfully clear to me that when we measure ability for a person who may not speak English very well or who may not have had opportunity to learn, that that becomes an obstacle to good measurement. And in fact, I wrote my first article on equitable assessment in 1982, dealing with the Wexler scales and especially the verbal side, because I heard people say very silly things about um, native people that their left brains were not as developed as their right brains. And that's why they had low verbal scores on the WISC and higher nonverbal scores on the WISC. And you know, my, my way of looking at it was, well, of course they have lower verbal scores. They don't speak English very well because they speak a couple of languages. Um, when I published my first test in 1985, which eventually became the Nagliari Nonverbal Ability Test, um, my goal then, as it is today, was to measure ability in a way that's not confounded by what a person knows. And so from the, the eight, in, during the 80s, when I was doing all my initial work on fair assessment, I did some other measures as well. But then I had the great fortune in, in 2004 and when I was speaking at a conference in Washington, D.C. to meet Dina and Kim. And several years later, Kim and Dina and I wrote this Helping All Gifted Children Learn book. I want to step in here and, and say hello to everybody. But I also want to set that scene for everyone because Dina and I were at this conference as coordinators of gifted programs in very large school districts. And so we went to hear Jack at that time because we were working on how to 
help equitable identification in our districts in Arizona. And so honestly, I, Dina, you will agree with me. We kind of went into that, listened to Jack that day, somewhat, somewhat um, challenging, I guess, because we went in thinking, I don't know, like, it, here's another thing. This is another thing. And um, I think I asked some pretty difficult questions that day. As a matter of fact, I know I did. <laughs> and so um, that was the beginning of this partnership that we've had for a very long time. And so I just, I, it's hard for me to be sitting in my office and not be able to see everybody there. But I do think that everybody on this call will agree that this has been a problem for a really long time. Um, and we have been really trying to come up with a way that we can have equitable identification and gifted programs. And I'd like to jump in as well, because Kim and I have actually walked in your shoes for many, many years, I, and still do. Um, as gifted coordinators, directors of gifted programs, this is not a new problem. As Jack said, he started recognizing it in the early 80s. And for decades later, we are all still struggling with the same issue that we perpetuate this under underrepresentation and we keep using the same tools and the practices. So it's no question that we're going to, um, that we haven't made any big changes in the last, in the last several decades. But I think that all of us recognize this because you're all associated with schools, you're all in a gifted, and you're all trying to um, do the same thing that, that the three of us have been doing for a very long time. So that background of having dealt with this from on both ends, both perspectives, in Jack as well, being in, in the schools initially, um, I think we're at a, a place now where the three of us anyway have tried to... Uh, Find ways, solutions that are different. And that's what today is all about. And I just want to add that we are going to explain the background behind what, we do, what we're doing. And then we'll show you what we've done. But then we're going to show you evidence that we have that it works. So we're going to close the whole loop with the research that, in fact, supports what we've done. And to me, that's always important. It's, it's nice to have a good idea. It's nice to develop a good instrument, but ultimately you have to provide evidence that it works. And we'll show all of that today. All right, so let's talk about um, a few things related to uh, gifted identification. I wanna uh, just start by um, recalling some years ago, I was at my office at, at George Mason, actually in 2003, I just started working there. And I got a call from the Wall Street Journal. And Dan Golden, who was the reporter, uh, asked me can I, uh, if he could, um, if I could talk to him about gifted identification. And he asked me this question, is it possible that a student could get 141 on your test and not be smart? And I remember thinking, that's a really good question. And the answer is clearly not. You're not gonna guess your way to a high score like that. And then he started talking to me about Devion. I actually knew about um, the school in which Devion was working. I had been at that school and talked with the supervisor, Susan Rhodes. And so basically Devion comes from poverty. His parents didn't have high school um, graduations uh, certificates. Um, he's not doing well in school. Teacher doesn't know that he likes to read books all day long. Teacher doesn't know that he even writes on an old computer that had a mouse that didn't even work. But when he took my test, he did so very well. But the key was he wouldn't have been recommended by the teacher to be tested. What Susan Rhodes did was test everybody. And that's how she found Evian. And Eventually, that got him the invitation to the magnet school. He was the only African-American student, but the problems were he wasn't getting good grades. He wasn't cooperative, according to the teacher. He didn't want to write a letter to Mickey Mouse like everyone else was doing. So there were these kind of conflicts. Um, and the thing is, the teacher didn't think he should be in the gifted program, but because of you know, my, my score, my, my test, he got in. 
And recently I found out about Devion. He did graduate. Here's his graduation picture. Here he is, you see, in his Marines outfit. And his father was, was interviewed by the local news channel. And I won't play the video because we don't have the time to, but I'll just tell you basically what Mr. Ross said was they were worried about Devion and the gifted program really helped him because it challenged him. And the, Mr. Ross was basically saying, if it wasn't for that, we don't know what would have happened to Tevion. But then Mr. Ross also reported how he and his wife decided they should get their degrees as well. So that one little number, 141, impacted Devion and the whole family. And the only reason he was found was because they used the universal assessment where everyone has the opportunity just to demonstrate how smart they are. And so here's the thing, we differentiate a gifted student from a talented student. So if you hear people talk about advanced academics and all that kind of stuff, those are the talented kids. You can be gifted, but not getting straight A's. And the thing is, the identification process that have been used, those processes really favor the talented kids over the gifted kids. And that's why my nonverbal test became so important in this whole field. Now, I've done some uh, estimating about how many gifted children of color are there in our country today. And I just went to the US population statistics, looked at the percentage of white, black, Hispanic, native, and children with two or more races. And I said, well, if 8% of those children are smart enough to be identified as gifted, in other words, a 92nd percentile score, how many students would that recommend? Would that would that um, that eight percent represent? And then I compared that to the actual number of students by race and ethnicity who are actually in gifted, and of course the difference between those two, and arrived at this number of eight hundred and forty-eight thousand four hundred and two children of color in the country. This is as of twenty eighteen who were smart enough to be in gifted, but didn't get in. And of course, when you look at English language learners, now of course that overlaps a little bit with the, the 848 number. Um, I couldn't parse those out, but still that's another quarter of a million people who are smart, but not recognized. Think of how hard it must be for a really smart person to feel alienated and unappreciated. There's a lot of people out there. Let's move along then. Let's talk about ability test content. Why does a WISC look the way it looks? Why does the COGAT or the Otis Lennon look the way it looks? Why does the Woodcock Cognitive have the kind of questions it has? All these kind of questions are the questions that we need to reflect on because the test is a, is a tool that can lim limit or accept. So most people don't realize that when you use a, a WISC or a COGAT or a Otis Lennon or those kinds of tests, that those tests really were built by people in the early 1900s. I should say people, I should say limited to men in the early 1900s. Um, if you go on my website, jacknaglieri.com, you can read my paper, 100 Years of Intelligence Testing and see all the details. I'm just gonna show you the highlights here. But it was these people like Thorndike and Otis of Otis Lennon, and Woodworth, some of the people you've heard of, some of them you haven't. Um, these were the people who created the raw materials, so to speak, 
that became the Wexler, Wexler and others. And they created tests for the US military to be used in World War I. And these tests were labeled the Army Alpha and the Army Beta. In other words, verbal tests and what we might refer to as nonverbal tests. The verbal tests had things like vocabulary, general information, synonyms, antonyms, math word problems. And the beta tests or nonverbal tests had things like block design and um, other things that you would use, you know, putting pictures picture together, these puzzle pieces together to make a whole. Um, and this is basically what we've had for a hundred years. Really interestingly, if you go back and read what the originators of these tests wrote, in fact, Yoakum and Yerkes, when they described the methods that were used in the Ami Alpha and the Ami Beta, explicitly said this, men who fail in alpha, the verbal, are sent to beta, a nonverbal, in order that injustice by reason of unfamiliarity with English may be avoided. They saw this as a social justice issue, as it is today. Really interesting is Ru Rudolf Pittner, who did a lot of um, work in the nonverbal measurement, um, wrote, a good intelligence test must avoid as much as possible anything that's commonly learned by the subjects tested. He wrote that in 1923. By the way, coincidentally, um, I taught at Ohio State University for 18 years in the same building that Rudolf Pintner was in when he was at Ohio State University a lot of years before me. <laughs> but uh, I think sometimes I think he must have been sending me a message somehow. You know? <laughs> uh, but here's the thing. If you look at it, Stanford Binet, the WISC-5, the WJ, even the KBC, and you look at the kinds of tests that they have, they all require knowledge. And that impacts the score that you're going to get. I'm gonna show you the best example of what I think is exactly wrong. It's kind of a funny way to say it, but uh, here's Woodcock's cognitive, in other words, his intellectual ability test called oral vocabulary. So the examiner is told to say to the student, the examiner points to the word big on the subject's page and say, tell me another word for big. And the correct answer, large, gigantic, or huge. Here's a sample item for the Woodcock's achievement test, Rodian vocabulary. Tell me another word for large, big, enormous, gigantic, huge. There's no difference between these two. And I think it's wrong. I don't like to use the wrong word when it's not really appropriate, but it's really appropriate here. This is blatantly wrong to use the same kind of question, but in one test call it ability and the other test call it achievement. And we've been doing this for way too long. And here's the problem. If you look at the tests that are used, to identify gifted children, the Kogat, the WISC, the Woodcock Johnson, Otis Lennon. So these tests all demand a tremendous amount of knowledge. And it's not just knowledge in the test questions, it's also knowledge of the directions as, you, as we'll see as we go through. And notice the Naglieri nonverbal ability test that, you know, that I published some years ago. That's the only test is not going to be influenced by knowledge. Now, the really scary part about all of this, um, this is a table that's from uh, the book that Dean uh, and Kim and I um, have written. I've pulled together all the information we have on race and ethnic differences for these different tests. And you can see it's, it's really very clear that tests that require knowledge yield bigger differences across race and ethnicity than tests that don't require knowledge. 
So it's not just a logical analysis that we're providing. It's a logical and a research-based analysis that clearly shows that these, I would call them traditional IQ tests, are, have misled us into thinking that these groups are different when the difference is confounded by measurement of what they know. And interestingly, if you look at the standards for educational psychological testing, the, the standards clearly say, just like Yolkman Yerkes said, that the content of a test may be considered unfair if it penalizes students for not having learned the content. It's pretty simple. Equitable assessment can be achieved if all examinees have an equal opportunity to perform, even if the test doesn't demonstrate psychometric test bias. So sometimes I hear people say, well, the tests aren't biased, so they're okay. And I always say, that's only half correct. Equity is the part that matters the most. You have to have test equity, not just a test that's free of test bias. And this was beautifully illustrated in this court case um, in Elgin, Illinois, the U46 court case, where a district of 42% Hispanics had only 2% of gifted for Hispanics. Obviously, something was wrong. And in this court case, which uh, Donna Ford was one of the experts, by the way, and she did a wonderful job explaining to the judge what a nonverbal test actually is all about. Um, and the judge ruled that the district intentionally discriminated against Hispanic students by demanding that all students who got and gifted had to have high verbal and math, verbal math, I would argue, um, test scores. And even though they used my, my Naglieri nonverbal test there, if a student had a really high score on my nonverbal test, but they didn't have a high score on the verbal test, they were rejected for the gifted program. And the judge ruled that the district violated the student's civil rights. So here's the point. If you want to measure how smart someone is, you have to measure how well they think separate from what they know. It's the thinking. That's what a gifted student does so very well. You could call it problem solving, you could call it reasoning, you could call it a lot of terms. But it's all about how well a person can figure stuff out. And you may not know a lot, but you can still be really smart. And wouldn't we want to find those students, give them the opportunity that they belong? I love this, um, I love this picture, it was a, an article but, uh, that I saw a couple of years ago. And it illustrates the thinking versus knowing. So some of the kids who had the opportunity to learn, you know, they're drawing their stars. And this little boy in the middle is drawing the, you know, the solar system. That's pretty awesome. This, whoever, the artist really got it when the artist rendered this. Anyway, so, this presentation really is about these really smart students out there who can become talented given opportunity to learn. That's what we're about. And if you, if you look at the amount of knowledge that's required by different tests and test usage, you can see Kogat, for example, has a lot of knowledge that's involved. It's, the, it's you know, 54% of these respondents use the Kogat. That's an obstacle. It's a real obstacle to finding these kids for a couple of reasons, which I'm gonna explain in a moment, but I will help you understand a few things. If you use, in this particular study, we looked at a, a nonverbal test all these children were Hispanic. Some had limited English proficiency and others didn't. They don't differ on their ability to think, 
they do differ on what they, they are, how much they know. And that's what this graph shows. Because the, ver the verbal and the reading for these kids was much lower because they're bilingual and they're struggling in English. So the thinking they're equal, the knowing they're not. So these are smart kids. We want to teach them. And I've shown that with a nonverbal measure, you can get equity in identification. Um, whether it's looking at overall mean scores, or I think more importantly in the paper I published with Donna Ford, where we looked at actual identification rates for white, black, and Hispanic students, virtually identical identification rates using a nonverbal test. In other words, when you measure thinking in a way that's not confounded by knowing. And interestingly, in this paper by Card and Giuliano, where they, they actually looked at what happens when you do universal screening and when using my test, the, the nonverbal test, before the screening program, during the screening program, and then when budget cuts meant they couldn't do screening in the same way, you can see what happens. When you use universal assessment and you use tests that measure thinking, you find kids from poverty. You find kids of color that otherwise would not have been found. All right, let's take a few more steps here. So when we talk about equitable identification, what we are, and I'm speaking about we being Nina and Kim and I, what we are concerned is about the language that's used in the directions, the language and knowledge that's required in the actual test questions, and in the case of an individually administered, the verbal expression required to answer the questions. And of course, students who come from backgrounds that are not so enriched are put at disadvantage. But we can do better. That's what, that's what we're all about. So here's where we're starting. We want to measure general ability. This is a concept that goes back all the way to Wexler. If you, if you um, ever read De Wexler's definition of intelligence, the aggregate or global capacity of the individual to act purposefully, think rationally and deal effectively with his environment. It's not the greatest definition, but it's clear that this is about this concept, which we call general ability. In fact, in the Wexler nonverbal scale, which I was author on, I, when I wrote that, that test manual, I made it clear that what we were measuring is general ability non-verbally, not non-verbal ability. And Alan Kaufman, who worked very closely <clears throat> with Wexler, reminded or added in his preface forward to the test that Wexler always believed in the concept of general ability. And he just believed that verbal and non-verbal scales with just different ways of measuring general ability. And that's where, that's the perspective that we are using. So we, in our book some years ago said, general ability is, a, is this like foundational ability that allows people to solve many kinds of problems. In schools, as, as gifted coordinators, we always look at those three scores, the verbal, the quantitative, the nonverbal scores from, from a test. And then we decide where that student is going to be placed for services based on the results of this test. So what Jack is here say, is saying here is that it's the construct of the test item that makes it verbal, quantitative, or nonverbal. It's not a doesn't measure a different way of thinking or a different set of knowledge. We're it's the construct that allows us to measure general ability. So in my school district, what I do is when I see those scores, yeah, it sure it'll help me guide. So if I know somebody uh, does really well on a quad quantitative test, I'm going to be looking at them for math placement, but I look at it holistically and I say, 
this kid is smart and therefore they're smart at everything that we do in school. It's not just for one subject area or one placement, because if you can solve those problems, you're using a lot of background information, knowledge or understandings, the ability. And what we're saying here is that it's all basic problem solving, reasoning, memory, and sequencing, how we, um, how we see information and make inferences and see relationships between ideas. And what we do in the, the test is the students are seeing, and we'll show you some sa samples coming in a moment, but the students are making those relationships based on their way of problem solving. And that crosses overall content, content areas. So my, my method is when I get those results, they're placed, they're considered gifted, and then we work with them and develop their areas of strengths. But it's not dictated by one of those uh, test batteries um, that, that would we get those results. Thanks, Dina. So let me illustrate this. Here's a typical called nonverbal test item. If you look at this, you can see the answer is pretty easy, right? What's really going on here? You have to look at the relationship between this and this and those and this in order to arrive at the answer. You need to understand the relationships. Now, that's really very similar to this. Which word is different? In order to answer this, you know, chair is different than these others. These are things that are alive, right? You, you have to understand the relationships among those. And the same is true here. If you do the simple math, three is to six is five is to and so on, it's understanding the relationships. Now I'm gonna give you an, a very simple one, a relationship one that you probably can't answer unless you're a musician. The answer is A. C7 resolves to F, E7 resolves to A. The thinking is the same, the content is different but the thinking is the same. And that's what we wanna get at. We wanna get at the thinking. Even though tasks are, are different, they all rely on general ability. That's what we're about here. Now, I'm not gonna bore you with a lot of statistical stuff, but there's a lot of really good research that supports the concept of what we call little g or general ability. And um, if you really want to read this, you can you know, look up these papers, um, whether, whether it has to do with the whisk, whether it has to do with the binet, whether it has to do with the woodcock. There's tons of research done by these people who I have known for decades and I trust them. Um, and it's all, it's all solid. Now, I just want to come back to this thing, this notion about test directions. Test directions. Um, when I was a grad student in the 70s, Jack Cummings and Brett Nelson published this paper, and I always remember this paper for some reason, um, where they went and they studied how many basic verbal concepts were used in the instructions for the California Achievement Test on Iowa Test of Basic Skills. And they showed how so many of the test instructions demanded comprehension that was beyond the reasonable grade for the student for which the test was intended, a problem. And then more recently, I found some interesting research with with where things like working memory and verbal comprehension is demanded by verbal instructions. And just to give you an example, um, in the COGAT nonverbal scale, coming back to why there are big differences, for five and six-year-olds, approximately 400 words, many verbal concepts, and this statement, this is what the, what the the teacher is telling the kids to help them understand. The small circle goes with the large circle in the same way that the small square goes with the large square. Unnecessary. The inclusion of verbal concepts strains, interferes 
with how well the students can actually perform. So how can you measure general ability equitability? When you have a verbal test, a nonverbal test, and a quantitative test. That was our challenge. And we decided we could do that. So these tests were explicitly constructed for equitable identification of those 848,000 and those 250,000 ELL kids. That was our goal. And we wanted to use the traditional verbal, nonverbal, and quantitative format. But we wanted to take out the knowledge, knowledge in the content of the test questions and the verbal questions and the quantitative instructions. And we, and we wanted to do it in a way that did not require any kind of verbal expression. So the first test was a verbal test. And Dina will talk to you a bit about that. Okay, so when, when Jack started off the presentation saying that we met about 15, 18 years ago and we started talking about this, well, about 10 years ago, we, st we just started saying, there's gotta be a way to measure verbal ability without language. Okay, so we thought about that for several years. And first of all, we thought, that's crazy, Jack, how can you do that? <laughs> and then he came up with an idea about five years ago or so and said, no, let, let's look at it this way. And so basically the approach was to use um, a language cognition expert psychologist, his name is uh, Alexander Luria, who really specialized in how we acquire language. And it's really based on a, a conceptual understandings of that are universal. So what we did when we developed the verbal items is we looked at it uh, verbal concepts that um, anywhere in the world, whoever, whatever language you speak, whatever culture you're from, and whatever background that you come from are universally understood. And so the verbal items here are on this test have no language, no words, but it's the language it's that, that is derived through the conceptual understanding of these items. And so, for example, um, a student is going to look at these uh, pictures and say, and think about them. Um, what similarities and what, 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 what construct is built in there that makes these um, similar? And if you, if each of us spoke a different language, you'd be, we'd be sitting here thinking, okay, for me, I, I speak Spanish. I would think in my, la in, in my language, you would think in another language, but the basic, it, basically we would all come to the same understanding that the, that the concept here is that these, there's only one picture here that is not an, an animal, that, that there's only one here that lives in the water. So those are the things that we think through our head while we're, while we're problem solving these problems. So there's, um, so it really doesn't matter the background knowledge that you have, where, where you're looking at, con at the concepts that are universally um, presented. So what we did was also we looked at uh, we we they con our publisher contacted a whole slew of different uh, experts in different cultures to say which animals are offensive or which ones cannot or what what uh, pictures would not be universally understood. So we removed all of that cultural bias from, from in the constructing these items so that everybody has the equal opportunity to be able to answer those um, based on how they think, not what they know. And these actually go down uh, from kindergarten. And when we were sampling, uh, piloting these, I actually worked with my head, gone, went into schools, into classrooms, and had kids look at these and then talk to each other. And it was amazing the um, excitement that they had when they were looking at that. And the conversations helped kind of guide us to see how these were going to be construed um, by children while they were thinking in some of the questions that they had. So this is, and, and we, this is similar to all the other batteries of, of the other tests that we have. The, so basically what Jack will show you in a moment is how the directions for this test are, um, there's no language involved either. So it's through animation and 
what you'll see here is this st the student sees these pictures and is thinking about those pictures and is thinking how how they all connect to each other and he says oh wait a minute the chair is not a fruit so then it's it kind of um, pulsates like that so he knows it's the right answer but now look he's going to choose the wrong answer and then he realizes oh that's the right answer so the students have the ability to correct themselves before they move on and it's so inherently understood uh, those it, so when we watch these little kids five-year-olds taking this and earlier in the chat someone said what's the best um, age level to to do this universal universal testing we have had success at it from based on a kinder, kinder eight, uh, as, as little as kinder, whatever works for you in your school. So for, for, for uh, what grade levels you're going to universally screen is good. Nonverbal, nonverbal um, test that I wrote for this trio of tests is an ev from an evolutionary standpoint, different than my NAC3 in that I have different kinds of ways of constructing matrices items. So they're all new, they're all different. I think they're really awesome. And testing mom doesn't know what they look like. So that makes me happy. Um, and yeah, and basically the same kind of instru animated instruction where there's a little thought bubble and this is what the students is looking at. And then they look at the options and then the choice is made and the same kind of animation. Okay, so the quantitative um, portion of this involves uh, sequencing numbers, relationships, patterns, reasoning. Um, it's, their, it's a student's ability to understand relationships and patterns without language. And so math being a universal language, um, there are no words that go into, into the quantitative uh, portion. So the directions are the same, They're the animated directions, again, having, having um, administered many, 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 many ability tests in my years of, of working with gifted kids, this is as simple as it gets. So looking at an algebraic reasoning um, balance, what equals one side equals the other side, and she is thinking about the choices that are available to her and then she chooses the correct answer so again there's there's no reading of directions it truly is looking at a student's reasoning ability and especially with with problems that they have not been accustomed to seeing before so here's the um really i think really in a lot of ways really exciting part of this we made these tests, we studied them. We had about 2,500 students take the verbal test, 36 the nonverbal and 28 the quantitative test. So this is three separate studies, three groups. Each group closely represents the US population. We get no gender differences, no race or ethnic differences, no parental education level differences. This is really, powerful because we have replication. We're replicating the concept of measuring general ability with different contents, and we get exactly the same results every time. With large samples, so this study, we've submitted it for publication. I'm still waiting to hear what the reviewers have to say, but this is an amazing, finding to be able to take the original concept and that goes all the way back to Joachim and Yerkes and all those, those guys back then and to fix it. Fix it by taking out the knowledge and then seeing, wow, now you get equitable assessment. So we will be releasing these in summer, which is really not that far away. Um, so we're really excited about that. and. We're going to be really emphasizing a couple of ways in which it should be used. Dina and Kim, you want to talk to this? Well, I just wanted to say that, um, like, go back to Devian, where they said they would have missed him if he weren't um, 
uh, if they didn't universally test everybody. And uh, the new test is going to come out with an, under that construct where we're going to be looking at lo local norms and building norms. And as a coordinator, I do that unofficially, un informally. I look when I get the test results, I think, who are the top kids here? Who are the kids that I really need to work with more? I don't care if they're formally identified at the 97 percentile, which is in Arizona what it is. But I want to say, who's really smart? Who are the smartest kids here? And so we're, we're presenting this test in a way that's not using national norms that have restricted identification for all these groups that we're talking, but about looking at the school, the kids that you are serving. I just want to end with um, just this one little thought. I love this quote from Martin Luther King uh, Memorial here in Washington, DC, where near where I live, uh, make a career of humanity, commit yourself to the noble struggle for equal rights. You'll make a greater person of yourself, a greater nation of your country and a finer world to live in. So with that, I'll say we welcome hearing from you in the future. Thanks for taking the time to be with us today. And um, thanks, everybody.